call a meeting to order. Uh, if we could, Alan, thank you. Uh, Pat, we'll start with you and just we'll do the usual. Yes, uh, good evening, Pat Chermello, representing the Old Colony Planning Council. Joe Coughlin, Town of Point, uh, the of uh, Town of Plymouth, Nuclear Matters Committee. Pine to Bois, appointee of the Speaker of the House. Bob Hayden, the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. Dave Johnson, Mass Department of Environmental Protection, representing Environmental Secretary Matthew Beaton. Kevin O'Reilly from Plymouth, uh, appointed by the Speaker of the House. Sean Mullen from Plymouth, appointed by the Minority Leader. Robert Jones, Health and Human Services. Any better? Robert Jones, Health and Human Services. Dave Nichols, appointed by Governor Baker. John Orenberger, Entergy. John Viveras, Mass Emergency Management Agency. Jack Priest, Department of Public Health. Richard Rothstein, Town of Plymouth appointee. Paul Smith, UWUA, representing the good men and women who work at Pilgrim Station. Did you introduce yourself, John? We want you to be recorded on the minutes. <laughs> Joe Lynch with Entergy. You can try to escape, but uh, the chair determines that there is, in fact, a quorum. Uh, before we get into reviewing the minutes of the past meetings, I just want to make a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. One is that uh, this meeting is going to be a little different than we've had for the last eight or nine months. We're finally going to, as a panel, have some time to actually talk amongst ourselves and bring up some new topics. Um, that'll be one of the most important things, I think. Uh, we'll also go over um, the news of the day and an update from the uh, interagency work group, as well as introducing new business. Uh, two of our past panel members uh, have left us between last meeting and today. Uh, Kurt Switz is uh, going to be leaving the Commonwealth, so he will not be on the panel any longer. And Jessica Casey has taken a new position down in Norwalk, Connecticut, and she's going to be moving, or has already moved, so Jessica will not be uh, returning to the panel as well. So with that, uh, review of the minutes. We're going to start with the November 28th minutes that um, you may recall at the last meeting because there had been a problem for some folks getting the minutes, we had not been able to uh, have time to review them. Uh, any comments on the minutes from November 28th? Joseph. On uh, page two, I assume that it's just a typo um, where it talks about Chair Russell. Uh, I assume they meant Miss Russell, uh, who was one of our uh, guest speakers. And paragraph two on the second page under whole tech yep. presentation. Um, more importantly, though, in um, some of, towards the back pages on page uh, six and seven. <clears throat> and I notice this on a number of the uh, uh, minutes that from time to time there are questions that the panel members ask of our uh, speakers when we have guest speakers. And on some of the issues, um, the response is they'll look into it and then follow up and get back to us with the information. Um, that rarely happens, uh, that there's a follow-up and the information is provided. The issues that are raised where there is an indication that uh, some information will be forthcoming is in our minutes. Um, but then, because there is no follow-up with the feedback, um, the minutes are open uh, so that that feedback is never recorded. Um, I would think that, and the difficulty has also been that uh, even though the minutes are excellent, um, often due to logistics, we don't get them for a month or two or three months after the meeting's over. Uh, and so it's sort of forgotten. Um, I would suggest that maybe in the future um, that when we get the minutes that we try and review them carefully. And if we've asked for, any of us have asked for anything and we have not gotten the feedback back that we resurrect what we asked for from the minutes and ask whoever it was uh, or do a follow-up with whoever it was to provide that feedback 
so that the panel can have them and the chair then can provide them to whoever's taking the minutes to uh, post them post facto uh, in the minutes so the minutes are complete. Um, there, are, there are a number of good things that I've just been reading November and January's minutes um, that I would say fall into uh, that category. Also <coughs> things such as, you remember when uh, Becky Ullman was uh, sitting there um, representing the interagency work group, um, she had mentioned that she wanted the panel's analysis on the PSDAR, which she's asked for other stuff like that. We've never done any of that. Um, we've got to decide whether we want to follow up as a panel, particularly because of her position, um, uh, and have a position to get back to her, uh, particularly when she's asked for something specifically like it was in the November uh, minutes. Uh, and uh, as I say, I noticed some um, other things that are in here. There's about three other things that uh, I would say fall into the uh, follow-up category, um, but there hasn't been any response to us. Uh, the same thing in the January um, minutes. Uh, follow-ups, number of follow-up things are in there, but uh, at least I'm not aware of any um, feedback back to us on them. Joe, so, can I ask you to do me a favor? Um, I think it's an excellent point. For the two minutes that you have there, do you mind just sending me a note with sure. th those topics? Be happy. And I'll be glad to follow up in both directions prior to the next meeting. I think it also covers us, particularly if we've asked a question Absolutely. and we didn't get any feedback. We can't leave it open because the minutes are public documents and uh, it, it makes us look like we're not following up on our own stuff. Uh, Alan, Senator Wolf has arrived. So, thank you for joining us, Senator. Thank you, Joe. That's a very good point. Sean, if I could, if, if yes, I could Bob. Chime in. And I, I just feel like that uh, I just feel the need to kind of uh, step in on on Alan's behalf a little bit here. I, I, I see what he has to do every day oh, yeah. at work, and he's he's got a, he's loaded with work. He's got a, a, a ton of work, a uh, ton on his plate in the office. Um, and I, I mean, I know we all, everyone here appreciates the work he does. There's no question about that. Um, as far as the turnaround time, I, I mean, he could certainly shorten the minutes to get it back quicker. I, I know that's not a problem, but I just, I just ask yeah. for um, understanding. Is you know, I, I think um, you're right. Everybody appreciates what Alan yeah. has done. Yes. Uh, I think it's amazing that he can turn around the quality of this. I would prefer the quality and live with the short timetable. I think pretty much everybody. That, that kind of raises the, and, and it's an excellent point, it raises the issue that I think in the November minutes it mentioned um, that the state was going after the contract for support for the interagency work group and hoped to have it online by January 1st. Um, if in fact that has happened, um, will we be able to get some support, administrative support, because that had been talked about in the past, maybe as part of that contract, um, so that uh, Allen's burden can be lessened or removed, and somebody else can do it uh, and do it through the paid contract or what have you, which then might speed up the process if that's possible. David, do you want to comment on that? To speak to that, um, the Commonwealth has hired. Unfortunately, the contract does not include administrative services. Uh, fortunately. The contract does involve the hiring of Four Points, which was the contractor that helped Vermont get through their decommissioning and their agreements with uh, Entergy and uh, North Star. So we did get the RFP out um, before the end of the year, and we had a meeting with about uh, seven companies, a typical process when the state releases an RFP, they're a pretty lengthy document, and they carve out um, to the extent we can identify everything. We carve out everything we're looking for services to provide. And then we have a session that is available for either phone calls or uh, active participation for folks to sit down with the representatives of the Commonwealth to talk about what we're looking for. We had seven different entities um, uh, attend that uh, hearing, or attend that, uh, not hearing, attend that meeting. And we ultimately had uh, either three or four, I think it was four, um, folks submit bids to uh, provide the contract services. We reviewed all those bids and we uh, elected, um, uh, I just said it, 
Four points. Four points. We elected four points to, uh, to fill those contract uh, services. And they were on board before the uh, uh, end of the year. So just at the beginning of the year, we had them on board. And they helped out a lot working with the interagency work group members uh, and the Attorney General's office, putting together the affidavits and other support mechanisms for the intervention that folks probably saw. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we wait of that section? Gotcha. Yeah. Well, we've got, a, we've got a multiple problem with this, which is that uh, with the departure of Kurt Swartz, um, we've got a gap in terms of who's going to post these properly. Kurt, behind the scenes, has been continuing to make sure that we live up to the, freedom, uh, the uh, open meeting law. And um, we're going to have to work on getting a new designee. Where, where I know you're here somewhere. John. Oh, I, John. John. Um, we're going to have to get a new designee to take care of this function. And most recently, uh, from one of the members of the public, uh, we really should be providing uh, closed captioning and other services for these. Uh, a firm's been identified. I just received the information today. It is, by the way, the law <laughs> that we, we have to provide this. And there's a cost associated with it. And as we know, uh, we don't have any budget. So I've already asked the uh, Secretary's office how we're going to handle that as well. So we may have to um, ask for a specific budget because, to your point, Bob, uh, <coughs> the burden on Allen is just tough. I mean, it's tough with all the other work. Mm -hmm. And uh, while we appreciate it, um, nobody could do a better job. Uh, perhaps somebody should be getting paid just to do this for us. And, I will, uh, I'll talk to the Secretary's office over the next couple of days and see if we can't get that done this year. With that, um, any other comments on the November 28th minutes? Move to accept. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained. Abstained. You weren't here for it. I was here, but not here. Okay. I'll abstain for you. Okay. I wasn't here. Though. Okay. Pass with two abstentions. Now on to the January 16th minutes. <coughs> Any comments on the minutes? Joseph? <coughs> Mr. Chairman, on page uh, 3, line 17, uh, there's a statement Mr. Priest asked how much time elapsed between the LTA review and conforming letter. This was to the NRC. I believe the clarity there is he was talking about the Vermont Yankee license transfer application because the response from Mr. Watson was 18 months. Um, so I'm assuming that's the question he had asked. That's correct. How do we want to rephrase it, Joe? Uh, I would just insert the words Vermont Yankee after uh, between, uh, uh, after the and LTA. So it's the Vermont Yankee license transfer application review. Did you get that, Alan? Thank you. Any other edits, corrections? Richard? Just a quick fix on page 4, lines 17 and 18. Um, I would, uh, ALARE should be spelled in caps, A-L-E-L-A-L-A-R-A. -E -A -A. It says A-L-E-R-A. -E I, I would just spell out as low as reasonably achievable. So that, that acronym might, might not be familiar for everybody. And then the uh, ensuing sentence there, it should have read, uh, uh, Mr. Rothstein also asked about radiation levels during decon and what were the implications by a reduction in the EB, EPZ. So just a few word changes. I could read that again if you need to. So it should be, uh, Did you get what it? were the, and what were the implications by a reduction in the EPZ? Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to adopt as amended? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Passed unanimously. Thank you very much. The, uh, the next agenda item, um, we got started on it briefly, and I'm going to just talk to it, and then I'm going <coughs> to ask uh, our colleague. Dave Johnson to speak to it in more detail. Um, since the last meeting, and um, with fairly good regularity, I've been speaking with both um, the Secretary's office and also with um, the Attorney General's office. Uh, 
they have been diligently working um, because of the nature of preparing the uh, petition, as uh, maybe Jim and Mary can appreciate better than anyone, and um, the discussions that are continuing amongst the uh, working group, uh, they will also be continuing with um, Entergy and Holtec. And uh, to that end, the Secretary's Office and David Johnson have gotten together to put together uh, an outline and summary of exactly where we are. So David, if you don't mind. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we, uh, just a few moments ago, I mentioned that we have indeed hired four points as uh, the service contractor for the Commonwealth to support us through the process of working with Holtec and Etergy on the decommissioning process. Those folks have been on board since the beginning of the year. And um, really the bulk of the work of the interagency inter work group subsequent to the hiring of Four Points was to work in support of the Attorney General's office in preparing the move to intervene on the license transfer proceeding from Entergy to Holtec. So that uh, was made official today. There was a press release for those of us who haven't seen that. So if you uh, Google that, that should come up and you can get a little bit more information about that. That was really uh, the bulk of the efforts. It's quite an effort actually to do that. And that was the bulk of the efforts of the interagency work group for the last month or so. So the, you know, the primary driving force of our desire to intervene is to best protect the Commonwealth's interest. And the, the four points that we are most focused on are the um, making sure that we have secured the potential costs and for the safe shutdown of the plant and to manage the spent nuclear fuel moving forward and uh, to follow up on the good work of the Mass uh, Department of Public Health in their discussions with Holtec about making sure that the decommissioning moves forward meeting the Massachusetts cleanup standards for radiological. And um, we've also identified the fact that we need to protect the assurance of meeting the Massachusetts requirements for non-radiological cleanup standards. And we need to ensure that we have the appropriate emergency planning uh, as we move forward through the decommissioning process. So that um, has really been the main emphasis of the folks the last month or so. And Secretary Beaton remains committed to work with the Attorney General's office and to also keep the Governor's office updated as we move forward with the next phase of working through the process with NRC and the tr license transfer application. Thank you, David. And I can mention a couple of other things from my conversations uh, with the Secretary's office. First is that the meetings with Holtec and uh, Entergy will continue um, now that this intervention petition has been completed and filed. Those will continue. And the second is that I reemphasized uh, a lot of the specifics that are in both our annual report and in the uh, 15 individual recommendations from the Board of Selectmen, uh, that those are equally important to us. This is not just a statewide view of what we hope to negotiate uh, in this case. There's a lot of local issues that are equally important, and we want to make sure those stay on the radar as well. So I, I can just tell you from... Um, my perspective, um, both the administration and the Attorney General's office have really uh, focused a lot of time and effort on this, and it will continue now with more discussions with Entergy and Holtec. Are there any questions or comments of either David or I, I, Ms. Paul? I have a question through the chair. Uh, David, I don't know if you're best to answer it or perhaps Mr. Mullen himself, but um, when the good governor put the handicap together, he specifically did not have the Attorney General represented. The Attorney General was going to be that independent body, the, the hammer of the enforcement, should we not be able to come to agreements in these memorandums of understanding with the individual State Departments. Um, I, d I don't know, are we losing that independence by actually providing these services to the Attorney General? Shouldn't they be separate, isolated, independent? Well, Paul, I can uh, 
We're blessed in many ways with the yes, we are. with this panel. And right to your left is the co-author of this particular piece of legislation. Who I know you can speak to it. Well, it's a little awkward for me because when we filed the legislation, we actually included the Attorney General in the original legislation, which came out in conference. So the, the actual makeup of the panel was changed. So, you know, it's a, it's a little awkward for me, Mr. Chairman, because uh, my desire and intention was to have the Attorney General represented. I do think that they can play as useful a role um, as, you know, as a partner from the outside as they possibly could at the table here. So I, I don't know how to be more direct than that. Clearly, they're an important component of the whole process yeah. going forward. I, I can tell you from my conversations, and I don't think I'm misspeaking, that the Attorney General's office uh, is in some ways grateful that that change did happen in conference committee because they are now, in effect, our attorneys. And if they were sitting on the panel and being our attorneys, it might have presented some different problems for them. So um, they are completely and fully engaged, I would say, David, wouldn't you? Yes, they are. And I think that's the best way to look at it is yeah. they are going to be most effective as our attorneys. That's their That's task. what they do. That's what they do. And, um, you know, so the governor with the secretary, the interagency work group concluded, uh, you know, it's best to have our work channeled through with the support of the AG. And in looking at the process we have underway, the determination was made that the best way to protect the Commonwealth's interest was to uh, intervene on the license application. And for that, uh, we really do need the Attorney General's support. And again, Paul, to your point, one of the things I personally like about it is like with our delegation from Provincetown to Weymouth and everywhere in between, which is totally bipartisan, the issues that we're confronting transcend any kind of politics. And with the administration and the Attorney General's office, so closely aligned on this. I think that's in our best interest. I think it's in the best interest of Commonwealth. I think it's the right way to proceed. Well, I would appreciate if, uh, if our chair were to look out for our mission and our objectives so that they're not lost to perhaps some other interest than ourselves. <laughs> that, that's a good point, Paul. And it's one of the reasons why during my conversations today, I reiterated what our interests are as a panel. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for David? All right. Hearing none, Joe, I'm sorry we're running a little late for you up for schedule, but I know you're an understanding man. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to provide an update on where we stand with some of the decommissioning activities. Um, came to my attention that we really haven't provided a detailed update since the September meeting. Um, since then, there's been some other issues that uh, have captured our attention, but uh, between myself and, and John Ornberger, um, we'll give you an update on, on where we stand. First, a uh, regulatory update. We talked a lot about this last year, but I think it's important to kind of recap where we are uh, in the regulatory process. As you all recall, uh, back on November 16th of 2018, uh, Entergy filed, uh, along with Holtec, a joint license transfer application, and then we uh, submitted our plant-specific post-shutdown decommissioning activities report, a decommissioning cost estimate, a decommissioning environmental impact evaluation, an update to our spent fuel or irradiated fuel management plan, and a commingled funds exemption request. On the same day, um, Holtec submitted their versions of the PSDAR, the uh, decommissioning cost estimate environmental impact statement. Uh, their version of the spent fuel management plan and their own commingled fund exemption. Uh, later uh, that year, uh, before, before the holidays, the NRC completed what is known as their staff acceptance reviews. These typically take about 30 days. So we received notification from NRC on uh, December 17th. They had completed a technical review of the PSDR and said, in fact, it's um, of the quality so they can go forward with a detailed review. Uh, the same was received on the license <coughs> transfer application on the 19th of December, and then finally the co-mingled fund exemption on the 20th of December. Um, the post-shutdown decommissioning activities report and the DCE um, were publicly made available by the NRC on their Adams website on the 18th of December, and a short time after it was noticed in the Federal Register. 
and that actually commenced the 90-day public comment period. So we're in that 90-day period where anybody from the public, any entity, any agency can provide written comments to the NRC on the PSDAR. They would be due on March 21st. As many of you know, we had a public meeting hosted by the NRC to discuss um, both PSDARs and the license transfer application in town on the 15th of January. And then on January 31st, the uh, joint license transfer application was finally noticed in the Federal Register. It was held up by the government shutdown. That started a 20-day request for hearing period, which ends today. And we've heard that, um, uh, at least I've heard at least two parties have uh, requested intervention status. It also started a 30-day public comment period. Um, for the LTA <coughs> license transfer application that will end on Monday, March 4th. Um, now a quick update on kind of dry fuel storage and uh, the status of where we are with our, our second uh, pad. Um, as many of you have heard in the past, we have one operational pad with a capacity of 40 casts limited to 38 uh, so we can move around the casts if necessary. Um, we will require 61 in total to move all of the fuel that's currently stored at the site, either in dry or in wet. Uh, we have completed 17 uh, casts using the Holtec System 100 uh, multi-purpose canister system. Each of those contains 68 fuel assemblies, so we have just over 1,150 um, stored in dry fuel storage. And that completes all of the planned activities in advance of us shutting down on May 31st of this year. Um, we will have a total of 4,114 spent fuel assemblies, um, and ultimately all of those will eventually be moved to the, to the pad. Um, and given the fact that our current pad only holds 40, um, we uh, made the announcement back in October, our intentions to construct a second pad. So that second pad um, has been designed and is going through the final details right now. It will accommodate all of the spent nuclear fuel stored at the site. It will have a capacity of 70 casts. Um, the last time we spoke, we didn't have the exact configuration, and it's going to be a 7 by 10 array. Um, it will be located 75 feet above mean sea level and about 700 feet from the shoreline. I also provided this table at the last meeting. Actually, I think Mr. Toomey provided the update um, about the design elements. Um, and where we stand. So we, at the time, still needed internal Entergy approvals that are all complete. We did initiate the permitting process on January 21st by uh, submitting the zoning application before the Town of Plymouth um, Division of um, Inspectional Services. We have not received that zoning permit uh, as of today, um, but uh, I was informed that it's about a 30-day process generally. We do plan on initiating construction of the pad in mid-2019, so sometime this summer, uh, assuming that all the permits um, have been received successfully. And the fuel transfer campaign that was uh, presented by both us and uh, Holtec um, will commence in 2020 and take uh, approximately two years and be complete by the end of 2021. Um, the next slide is probably not very easy to uh, to see, but it is one of the design drawings that shows the, um, the pad. It is located in that upper elevation. Um, you can see in the center of the picture the 7 by 10 array. Uh, the bottom uh, left-hand corner, you'll see Rocky Hill Road and the distance uh, from the pad to Rocky Hill Road. And there's some varying details that are being finalized for the uh, the fence barrier systems, the new security area around the pad. You also see a small building in kind of the upper uh, left-hand corner of the fenced-in area. That will be the new um, central alarm station, so that would be where security would have 24-7 uh, staffing and, and coverage of the eventual new security owner-controlled area. Uh, this was one of the drawings that was submitted with the zoning application uh, to provide details to the uh, inspectors and, and authorities within Plymouth to see whether or not it was uh, appropriate. I, I can't read. What's the distance to Rocky Hill Road, Joe? Uh, I can't read it either. Um, I think it's uh, a little over three, 300 feet. 
Um, yeah. I, I was just given the image. I could check for you and verify that, Jack. I think that was mentioned in an earlier meeting, Jack. <clears throat> Joe, I was just wondering how wide, how bigger than an area is that? The, the actual area itself? Yeah. Um, I think it's about an acre and a half. I, I don't have the exact dimensions. Um, why don't I take an action to provide some of the dimensioning information? Um, I actually probably have it on my laptop, but uh, um, the replication of that drawing is a little difficult to uh, read. I wanted to just give people an idea that we have progressed rather significantly with the design phase and to the point where we can now request uh, uh, approval for the permitting. Um, the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust uh, Fund, as of December 31st, 2018, stands at $1.028 billion. And um, as a comparison, at the uh, end of 2017, so a year, a year before that, we were at 1.068, so about $40 million difference. Um, that was due to changes in the uh, Nuclear Decommissioning Trust balance due to market fluctuations, and we do have to pay administrative trust-related expenses. Um, and so that uh, in itself is the, uh, the difference between, um, you know, the one year. We've made no withdrawals from the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust, so this is simply market changes and, and fees. I think what's significant is that in December, the market took a fairly significant hit, at least it did on my 401k, um, but it had little impact overall on the overall trust balance because the trustee invests in very conservative uh, investments to kind of maintain um, that balance as close to neutral as possible. Um, there was a question at the last meeting um, by uh, Dan Wolf regarding whether um, taxes could be taken out of the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust. The answer to that is taxes are a qualified withdrawal from the trust. However, there is a caveat, and that caveat is if for some reason the taxes were on the dry fuel storage facility itself, we would need the commingled funds exemption to allow it for, for fuel-related taxes. Um, currently, the, um, the, the Dry fuel storage is not separate from the taxes that we currently have an agreement with the town of Plymouth. Um, but the commingled fund exemption is something that we did request as part of the submittals back in November, and that's pretty standard across the, uh, the industry. In fact, we do the same at Vermont Yankee or did the same at Vermont Yankee. Um, with that, I would turn it over to John Ormberger. John's going to step you. Just, just real quick, I'm sorry. Before. Sure. Can you go back to the second slide that talked about the PSDARs? I'm, I'm just a little confused because you referred to to one PSDAR and then you referred to both PSDARs, and so I'm, it's not evident to me in this which PSDAR you're talking about in each circumstance. Uh, all, uh, all of the discussion about NRC approvals and, and things like that or reviews have to do just with the Entergy PSDAR. Okay. The NRC will not review the Holtec PSDAR until they make a decision on whether the license transfer uh, is going to be approved. So they, they recognize our submittals as the official submittals, and then they would look at the ones from Holtec in, in <coughs> conjunction with approving the overall license transfer if, if they get to that conclusion. Okay. So Holtec would not have been receiving any information about whether their PSDAR has met the, the NRC staff acceptance review until sometime in the future. Okay, I misunderstood what you said then. Because I thought you said they did a hearing on both, but I believe the hearing was only on the Entergy one, right? Well, the pu yeah, the, at right. the public meeting, um, which I think is the next slide, um, the, the NRC kind of came out and said, we will take comments on PSDARs and on the license transfer application. So they kind of broadly said, you know, we're here to listen to all comments, and then they'll sort them out later once they're reviewing either our PSDAR or the Holtec version. <laughs> Joe, I think I <coughs> read something last month that Holtec had submitted sufficient information to the NRC so they could do their review at the formal review at the appropriate time. So they obviously took, I guess, an initial look at uh, to make that determination. Uh, that was 
I saw the Federal Register somewhere. Okay, Thank, thanks, Rich. Um, we would not have received that, so I took all the information based on what Entergy had received from the- Actually, uh, Mary had sent that to me. Thank you, Mary. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Joseph. Um, while we're on the topic, and before uh, John starts, <clears throat> the two items you had on your chart of the PSDAR comments and the license transfer application comments and the dates they were due by, um, it's not a question for you, Joe, but um, uh, David, is the interagency work group, I may have missed it, in what they've been working on, have they been working on any comments on those, those uh, documents because of the deadlines um, listed both coming up in March? Or will they be? Uh, you know, we've looked through both PSDARs. We focus primarily on the Holtec PSDAR uh, as a means of supporting our effort to get the intervention in timely. So, you know, at this point, it's time to move forward and and look at both and you know try to secure protection with the Commonwealth. Any other questions before? Let me make one comment. I know there's. These timetables um, are clear here from the NRC. One of the things that has been of great interest to me, and I think everybody else, is the timetable. Now that the intervention petitions have actually been filed, what's that mean in terms of the timetable going forward? So I had a couple of conversations with the folks at the NRC, who, by the way, have been terrifically responsive to me. So uh, I mean the same day, even today, when the uh, offices were closed because they had a uh, a dusting of snow somewhere in Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, they did. And, um, but they were great. They got right back to me and sent me the regulations uh, to try to do this. And I'll make this available to everybody if they like them. But it's in the Federal Register from Wednesday, April 20th of 2005. It's the most current regulation. And it's called the Model Milestones for the NRC's adjudicatory procedures, including the uh, applications for an intervention. Um, I asked the question specifically, well, do you have a sense of the timetable? Because it's very important to Energy, Holtec, and to all of us to understand what the intervention is occurring, what are we looking at in terms of the timetable here. Um, Amy Snyder, who you may recall, was with her. Amy said uh, very, very brilliantly, frankly, uh, we don't really have a timetable for that yet, so uh, they'll get back to us. But that's just another addition to this that um, we don't know is the answer today. Sean, if I could add to that, last month when uh, Mr. Watson was at uh, doing the PSDR public meeting and our NCAP meeting update, he did state that the um, NRC approval of the submitted PSDRs, Entergy or Holtex and or Holtex could conceivably be delayed beyond a year depending on the type and degree of anticipated intervention. Um, as you and I have talked, uh, Privately, there could be good intervention and bad intervention. Uh, I'm not going to define those here, but uh, you know what I'm talking yep, about. Absolutely. So I don't think uh, from NRC's standpoint that uh, they're going to be divulging anything more in the short term on this. Okay, thanks, Rich. John? <coughs> okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, f I just want to give an update on uh, Entergy, uh, our, our focus on employees at the station and what Entergy is um, doing uh, to help employees uh, who are, are currently at the station uh, through this process of, of de-staff and, and getting into decommissioning. Um, Entergy established a program open to all employees at the site uh, for talent absorption and that is uh, within the Entergy system. Uh, Entergy has about 13,000 employees within the Entergy system uh, open for uh, employment in other locations, uh, including transmission, distribution, uh, any, uh, any of the other nuclear plants. Um, about 115 of our employees entered into the process, and for various reasons, uh, some uh, uh, came back out of the process. Currently, there are 51 people advancing through the process, 34 have committed to new positions within the energy system. 
Uh, we have held uh, employee information sessions uh, for 401k plans to make sure people disposition those properly as they go through uh, into retirement or move uh, out of the energy system. Uh, we've also held uh, pension uh, benefit uh, information systems uh, in group settings and also personal settings for people uh, to be able to understand exactly what they have uh, for benefits um, within their pension uh, program. Sorry. Okay, information uh, sessions. Um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Career Services has been at the station uh, several times, uh, probably up to a dozen times, uh, helping out with some of the career services that uh, people were looking for, uh, including resume writing, interview skills, and then uh, where uh, people would be uh, relative to unemployment. We've also had our relocation services people at the site uh, to make sure that anyone who is interested in talent absorption and moving to one of the other locations at, uh, in the energy system uh, understand what they have for benefits relative to relocation. Training for future career opportunities, we uh, have a program uh, in place to make sure that we're, uh, well, we actually surveyed uh, put out a, a survey for people to give us input on what they'd like to see for uh, professional development um, uh, for, the, for their future and future career opportunities. We've held the, the following uh, training sessions, professional engineer license preparation, wastewater treatment license preparation, project manager certification. Uh, we've done a whole office, Microsoft Office suite uh, training, uh, pressurized wa uh, water reactor um, uh, classes held by Westinghouse, uh, and then some of the professional, uh, you know, uh, online um, s services uh, like LinkedIn and Glassdoor uh, job searches. And then other initiatives that, they, that we're working through for federal and state programs, the Trade Adjustment Assistance, the Department of Labor Assistance, and then uh, we at Entergy have held open house um, sessions for the uh, rest of the, uh, where the rest of the system can come up to, has come up to Pilgrim Station uh, to just basically show off their areas, uh, not just, not just the, uh, the, the job itself, but also the communities that those jobs are located in. And it's, a, you know, through Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, Arkansas, uh, Texas. Um, so uh, those people have come up and given us uh, open house sessions there for anyone who was interested in that. Uh, we just wanted to give that update to, uh, the, to the uh, panel uh, to let you know that we are thinking of the people and uh, they are at the, at the uh, top of the list for the energy system. Any questions? Pat? You mentioned <coughs> about 150 that have taken that initiative so have been mm -hmm. uh, put into some other part of the organization. Um, what, what, there's about 600 employees originally there. What happens to the rest? And uh, for uh, for anyone else, there'll be a certain portion of people who will stay in the Phase One organization for emergency preparedness and uh, and production at the station uh, in that Zerk Fire period. A uh, certain amount of people uh, will go uh, into retirement. Uh, there are local opportunities for people uh, within electric distribution, transmission, that kind of thing. I know that people have taken advantage of that. Uh, and um, otherwise, uh, that, that, that's about it. That's the biggest demographic uh, spread right now that, that I'm seeing. And half of the 115 uh, decide not to do it? Correct. Hmm. John, is, is there any assistance that you asked either the state or the federal government for that you didn't get or that you think would be helpful as you look at at some of these transfers of? Uh, no, and I, I can't say enough. The, the sessions, let me just go back to uh, one slide. Oops. Uh, Department of Career Services, it, they, they've gone uh, way over and above uh, anything that I could ever imagine. The pe people from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Department of Career Services have been great. Uh, everything that we've asked for, uh, every service that we've requested from the Commonwealth has been great uh, up to this point, yeah. No, no, nothing has gone unanswered. Any other questions? 
Thank you very much, John. Thank you. I don't, I don't have a question, but I have a, a comment. I was for, hoping you would, I, No, no, and I, I will couch it with, of course, negotiations continue. Yeah. But the one thing that I can say uh, for the state and for the energy company is it's, it's certainly different than in 1999 when we were deregulated and we were sold and we, we were actually uh, kept like chattel on site because they needed the licenses to continue running the plant. As opposed to now, the company is reaching out and trying to adsorb people, recognizing the talent. So of course, there'll, there'll be spots in the negotiation and we'll continue to talk, uh, but it is appreciated the interest that the, and the difference between 1999 and today. I mean, the, I think that's great and you were the one I wanted to hear from, but. Um, I think it would also be helpful, John and Joe, is that as this goes further along, that we see the top line numbers, it would be helpful for us to understand how much of an effort's being made and of that 600, you know, if ultimately it's 85 or whatever the number is, that decide to move to a, a warmer climate, let's say, than here. Um, we'd love to know those specific numbers in the future. So, thank you. Any other questions for Joe or John while we? Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to move on to the next piece. Um, we'll talk about the um, next annual report, but I think there's a number of, um, of our colleagues who, going back to um, one of Joe's earlier points about there's been a lot of topics, and I know, for example, Pine, um, you had some questions. I, I, I did. Is now a good time? Yeah, now's a great time. Um, I, I, um, I think that uh, one of the things mentioned early on is that we have this PSDAR at our doorstep and um, it would be great if not only the interagency panel but this panel and certainly the community at large um, uh, spoke about that. But I had some questions in reading and like uh, the, the interagency work group I concentrated on Holtex PSDAR. So um, I have a motion if you would bear with me. Please. Um, and I actually printed it out. Should I pass those out now? Sure. Yep. Um, here, would you pass those that way and maybe pass those that way? <clears throat> so as that's going around, I'll just read it. Um, so based on the whole tech, uh, that's the HDI PSDAR from November 16th, 2018, whole tech and CDI et al. intend to rely on several historic do documents that so-called bound their anticipated work on the Pilgrim site. In addition to the 2002 and later, uh, and later GIS and SEIS, Holtec refers constantly to the, quote, draft NIPTES permit MA0003557 and the fact sheet that was part of that draft permit. Because this draft permit was intended to update the Clean Water Act permit that expired in 1996, and because it covers the intake and discharge of water and pollutants into Cape Cod Bay, it is important to the operations and cleanup of Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station that it is timely issued. However, because Holtec references the draft permit and the final permit is yet to be issued jointly by the Environmental Protection Agency, that is EPA, and MassDEP, it is important that we understand when this will be issued and if it will be in place to protect the environment, environmental resources of Cape Cod Bay. Therefore, I suggest and move that Holtec, the EPA, and the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, or DEP, appear before this body and DECAP in March, if possible, to discuss the schedule of issuance of the updated permit, the levels of contamination known and expected to be addressed, addressed on site, and the means and methods for protecting the quality of waters of Cape Cod Bay throughout decommissioning, site cleanup of contaminants, and restoration of the site for reuse. Any other comments you want to make on it before I open it for questions or comments by the panel? Well, I just want to say that this is uh, from, from the work that I do with the Jones River Watershed Association and Cape Cod Bay Watch. We've been um, hot on this issue um, going back to before the license was reissued in 2012. Um, there was a consideration and notice of intent to sue EPA over the fact that the license was so expired. Um, and it's troubling that now we're getting into decommissioning and we're relying on something that's not even 
uh, under the authority of EPA, but a draft. So the old permit, the expired permit, doesn't cover what we're talking about uh, once the, 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 uh, the operations cease. Um, and we need to, you know, working uh, briefly on our little task force group, the site cleanup task force group, we had a lot of discussions of what is the legacy contamination, what are the things that we're going to be dealing with, and how much of that is just going to leach into Cape Cod Bay. The PSDAR from Holtec says, oh, we're going to leave the intake structure, we're going to leave the discharge canal, we're going to leave the revetments, we're going to leave the pipes in the ground, we're going to leave everything below three feet, basically, um, and that you know, worries me because we don't have that information, even though several times, and this goes back to Joe's earlier comment, we've asked for, you know, what's that legacy report? Where is it? <clears throat> Can we see it? Um, so that we understand what we're talking about. We don't have to worry about it or have sleepless nights. We're just address the issues that are in front of us and can get the site cleaned up. Okay. Any other uh, comments or questions on the motion? Yes, Joseph. I, I guess in looking at the motion, the one thing that uh, strikes me is that Holtec is the applicant uh, for potentially taking on the future license. The issue of not having a renewed uh, NPDES permit lies with the licensee. So, the, so you can come too, Joe. Well, my, my point is I'm not sure they're going to be in a lot of position to talk about what may happen in the event that they do get approval for the license transfer. So I, I'm not going to speak for Holtec, but it seems kind of unusual to get them involved at the point where maybe by the time the transaction is approved or a decision is made that it won't be approved, that permit, in fact, could be uh, approved by EPA, DEP. But it's been going on, as you know, for a very long time. So. Uh, you know, I see your points and I understand your concerns, but I don't think, you know, Holtec is in a position to talk to something as an well, applicant. Well, it was there, but it was their PSDAR. No, and I understand. They clearly read the draft permit and they clearly have some assumptions based on that. And so, you know, all I'm trying to do is get to understand, the, you know, have a clear, clear mind in terms of how they view that. Do they think that's final? You know, do are they feeling like that's you know, all they're going to have to deal with. That's what I want to know and hear from. And I, it is an error that I didn't include Entergy to, to uh Are to you come. making an amendment to it to add Entergy? Actually, I would like to uh, uh, ask so our friends Entergy to come okay. as well. Thank you, Joe. For Thanks. I, I might suggest that we start with just the agencies providing an update on they, where they stand with the review of the application that's been in-house with the agencies for many years. Would you accept that? I, I am not concerned uh, necessarily about the timing of it because I think it'll be too late to help my comments on the um, on the PSDAR. Although maybe we could have a, a work group meeting before well, we're um, and, that and talk next. about that. But um, uh, but if we want to divide it so that we can um, we can get more more thorough information from each party, that would be fine with me as long as we get everybody. So would it be acceptable to amend the motion to say EPA and the agencies first, and then subsequently we go back and there will be comments from the public. Yeah, yes, I'd David. like to hear what David. David. Yeah, I was uh, going to make a couple comments if I could. Um, firstly, the levels of contamination known and expected to be addressed on the site is not something that would typically be picked up in a NIPTES permit. That's going to be strictly the intake and the discharge. So I think what we're really looking for, at least what I would be looking for here, is for the agency to talk about what the process is for addressing the permit moving forward. You know, clearly with decommissioning coming on, it's going to be a different permit, if a permit at all. And what Holtec uh, may or may not know, and what the agencies could speak to, is what the process would be for modifying the permit if Holtec or Entergy or anyone was looking to use the existing permit in a different way. As it stands now, the permit is only uh, available to, for certain tasks and certain contaminants to be discharged. So uh, they, you know, they're not going to be able to rely on it, my understanding, is that they're not going to be able to rely on it in its current form. So I think that would be really the place to start versus asking the agencies for information they're not going to have, the contamination known or unknown, and is not directly relevant to the processing of a NIPTES permit. 
Yeah, I think I, I think in the in the motion I was I was going a little bit beyond the NIPTES permit, you know, like a 21E site assessment or so, something like that. But I, I, I we know uh, for a fact that Entergy has been required to keep a, a track record of any spills and all that sort of stuff on site. We know it. We know that it exists. What 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 I haven't done is read it because I haven't seen it. Um, and and so the motion in, is the NIPTES permit and what you're talking about. Well, see, that's, though, that's uh, different people, different focus areas. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of a scattershot approach. Um, and I, I think... Focus me, Dave. Uh, I, I'm trying. So I think we're going to be most effective if we, um, you know, kind of limit this engagement to the NIPTES process. You know, everybody knows the permit's been long expired, so the old permit remains in force. And we all know it's the nature of that discharge is going to change very soon. So I think the questions for the agencies are, you know, how do they manage that moving forward? How are they going to manage the change in the nature of the discharge? What options are available to Holtec or Entergy to continue that discharge? Um, you know, looking to release different contaminants. What would those contaminants be? How would they, um, you know, uh, monitor them moving forward? Where are they coming from? And uh, I think that would be productive. And then, you know, relative to kind of the separate issue, what's out there from a, a groundwater and surface contamination perspective, uh, that is, uh, I think, different folks. And that is going to be more uh, mass DEP folks and um, Department of Public Health folks than it is going to be EPA folks. So I think different, I think we just want to, you know, make sure we get those in the right silo. Yeah, please, Jeff. So the, the, the Department of Public Health does not keep a record of spills that the plant may have had from a, I was speaking just from the radiological standpoint. So, so Joe, I think what Pine is looking for are the Part 75G records, historical records over time which uh, the utility is required to uh, keep a record of uh, radiological contamination spills, and how would we be able to review those? Uh, I'd be more than happy to take an action to see what the accessibility of those are um, to be made public. Uh, I know they're audited by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, so that may de facto make them a public record, but I'll be more than happy to take that action. As to the non-radiological contaminants, that would be, I would defer back to the DEP uh, to follow up on that question. Sure. In, the, in that regard, we do conduct regular inspections out there of the hazardous waste storage practices and of their compliance with the air quality mission for any backup generation that they have to, uh, you know, for diesel generators or whatnot. And those records are available and uh, they're not all that exciting because it's, you know, that's pretty uh, nuts and bolts stuff. And the um, operator or o owner of the facility is obligated to notify the Commonwealth Math through Mass DEP of any releases or discoveries of um, listed contaminants that are found to exist above reportable concentrations or are released in a quantity above a reportable quantity release. So we have all those records. Um, you know, we have looked through them. It, you know, it's going to be things like oil releases, um, you know, if a truck has a diesel release and, and so forth. So um, there's no open releases. Whenever those releases occur and we're made aware of it, and they're obligated to tell us if it meets either one of those uh, criteria, they're also obligated to clean them up and close them out through the oversight process. And uh, as it stands right now, there are no open, unresolved, you know, uncleaned up releases at that property um, for the oil and hazardous materials that we regulate, that we're aware of. Um, additionally, they have a groundwater discharge, and we had uh, developed an administrative consent order with Entergy relative to that groundwater discharge because they were requested and uh, volunteered to upgrade their nitrogen reduction efforts within their treatment facility. Mm -hmm. And they were issued a new permit that required an uh, enhanced level of treatment for nitrogen. They had some uh, challenges meeting that because of the very low flow. 
and they anticipate having the flow uh, reduced to a level below the requirements for a groundwater discharge permit for their sewer treatment facility. So that is uh, also something we can provide some information on, but that's also, um, you know, stuff that's all publicly available. Any other questions? Yep. So, Pine, another tool for us to use on searches would be to uh, either go through the NRC or to go to their Adams site and look at the plant status updates. So when they have a recordable event that they're required to report, you, we would be able to uh, word search through uh, Adams to pull those records as well. Pine, do you want to um, do you want to amend it or do you want to have ask for a second? I still like the way I wrote it. <laughs> so I guess I would ask for a second. And then we can sort through how we're going to approach that. Okay. I don't think, I think the, the general feeling that I have is we still need this information. I don't, I don't necessarily feel like we can need and or di digest it in one session, mm -hmm. be that session 20 minutes or 45 minutes or even an hour. So I'm happy to segment that um, and, and, and allow the, work group to figure out how to get it presented and to get EPA over here and to okay. tell us what they're going to do about that stuff. So do you want to amend it to include uh, Entergy? Oh, and definitely amend it to include Entergy, yes. Thank you. Is there a second on the amended motion? Everybody in the, everybody understand the motion now? Same thing. Same, same exact motion. Holtec, the EPA, EEA or DEP, and Entergy appear before Endicap in March, if possible. So, yeah. Yeah. if not possible, then, uh, or uh, uh, how about, and subsequently, how's that sound? I think if possible, it's subsequently. Okay. So. Sean, uh, before we take a second and a vote, uh, just my memory just uh, got caught up about five years ago on the NMC. Uh, this issue came up very heatedly, and I spent quite a bit of time contacting Mass DEP. I think I may be in touch with one of the department heads or assistant commissioners at the time, uh, and I was told that DEP, DEP and EPA were actively working on this, finalizing this NPDS, so, you know, this was going on for about six months back and forth, and uh, then uh, didn't hear anything back and lost touch, so it's, you know, it's not like this hasn't been pushed by various parties, uh, particularly in recent years. Thanks. Is there a second on the motion? I, Joseph? I don't mind making a second, yeah. but I'm going to have a, if I do, I've got a question for David and Jack relative yeah. to it. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so I'll second it, and then my question is this. The way that it has been uh, structured and explained by Pine, are you comfortable um, that this can be carried out the way it's written, even with the flexibility that Pine has offered to say, you know, if possible in March, maybe later if not, and so forth and so on. Are both of you guys comfortable that this can actually be done? I'm not comfortable it could be done in its current forms. I, I wouldn't be voting for it in its current form. Okay, that was my, that's my concern. Yeah, it, uh, again, my memory is slowly but surely coming back <laughs> relative to our engagement when I was in the legislature relative to the EPA's really shirking of their responsibility, if you will, to, to update, to up, well, to, to fulfill their responsibility. I, I think actually this could be more general. And I think what this committee needs is an update on the background of why the EPA didn't do what they were responsible to do, what the potential ramifications of that are, and DEP's role in that. Now, now that, you know, it, it's going to take a minute for the to find the neurons in here of the meetings we had when I was in the legislature with uh, the EPA on this issue because it was it was a huge miss on the EPA's fault uh, uh, part for years and years. So Pine, I, I mean, I, I, I will vote for this only because I think it would get the process going of us understanding uh, how, how remiss the EPA was as far as their responsibility at the site. But I, I'm not, I, I'm actually not sure whether what you're asking this to do is, is, is possible. I, I just don't know. 
because I, I don't know whether they're going to be able to come and be able to answer these specific questions. I'd, I'd love for them to, but. Well, uh, you know, I, I don't either. But let, let me share this with you. I, I uh, emailed the, the permit writer the other day, and I said, okay, so it was supposed to be issued in October at the latest. You know, I haven't found it. You sure didn't send it to me. Uh, is there a new schedule? And he wrote back and said, no, we don't have a schedule. Um, we, we're, we're, uh, we're addressing the, sub the extensive comments or something like that um, that we received. And I know, I know they got extensive comments because we weren't like jumping for joy at, at what had been written. There was lack of clarity there. But I, I don't feel like, I feel like we are at this uh, intersection where we have a deadline with the, with the facility going offline. We're going to change, the NIPTES permit changes. We've got a potential, you know, global uh, cleanup company coming in here to set a, a new standard for how these things are happening, referencing a draft permit that's being rewritten. And I feel like somebody, you know, and, and <coughs> God knows, I hope, the EPA would show up here and say, okay, we get it now. Thank you for calling us in. Uh, we know this is important. We're going to get it done. If, and, and the reason EPA is in my motion is because it's a joint permit. Yeah. Because, because uh, we are one of the few states that, I think there's only five of the 50, that, that where, where our state agency, environmental agency, isn't the sole writer of the permit. So. So that's why DEP is there. If DEP feels like answering the, you know, I'm not, I, I, I'm not worried about the the cleanups that you that that you knew about and you said were going to happen. What I'm worried about is that the whole tech PSDAR, which is the one I prefer to look at because I want it done right away, and so I want it done well, um, seems to leave the pipes in the ground. And we know, Jack certainly does, and people in the audience certainly do, that we have tritium leaks. We know that we've had issues at the facility. We don't know what's in, we don't know, I don't even know a map of all the pipes. So is there stuff in the pipes? Should we be asking for the pipes to come out of the ground, Plymouth? Do you want them buried there? Little pipes in the ground? Um, we, that, that in order for us to share with the public information, we have to have the information. Fine. So I don't, I'm not trying to delve into DEP's long record of success at cleaning up these, these sites. I'm trying to find the stuff that's still there so we know that Holtec goes in and does a nice thorough job and the place is really clean. You know, it's the same with the transmission station, honestly. What's going to happen with that? So, so to me, this is a conversation starter. It's not intended to put everybody up on the, you know, firing range and give them one shot to get it right. No, it's to start the conversation and to please let us get somewhere about really cleaning up this facility so that everybody here feels great about it. Let me just interject. Um, the next topic on my agenda for the discussion is the working groups. Would you be comfortable and would the group the consensus be if we just limited this to the EPA for March? That we for put starters. It, for starters, to put it on the EPA. I would be delighted but, if the But understand, please understand that they don't write the permit alone. Understand. They write it with their partner. And and David, um, you wouldn't feel comfortable supporting the motion that said that DEP would show up if they showed up to discuss it? Well, I wouldn't uh, support the motion as it's currently constructed. As I mentioned, I think it's a little too, um, it lacks some focus yeah. to be eff effective. And, um, you know, likewise, as uh, the Senator was speaking about having EPA come in and talk about why they didn't issue the permit. I'm not sure that that's really germane to what we're doing either here. You know, right now we're looking at decommissioning. So as I try to get to, I think the most important thing is for us to understand how the permit works moving forward mm -hmm. and kind of, uh, you know, look to the agencies, DEP included, to deal with the permit now with the set of facts we have now, which is, you know, new, not what the permit was looking at previously, 
and talk about how that permit process needs to work and how it's going to be protective and how it's going to be timely. And the way the process typically works in Massachusetts, which like Pine mentioned, is one of four states that does not have primacy for the Clean Waters Act. Uh, typically, EPA is the lead agency. Uh, we support them. We issue a joint permit that we both sign. If, um, and then we, you know, the permit needs to comply with Massachusetts requirements, which might be above and beyond the EPA requirements. So EPA won't write a permit that doesn't comply with our requirements. But so I do think we can, we can get to all this. But I think as I look at this, this looks to me to be three or four different motions to be effective to get the right people here and to get them here prepared. What would you start with? Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to start with the NIPTES permit uh, in so much as Holtec has mentioned it and appears to be uh, thinking that it has some value for decommissioning. And uh, I think it would be interesting for us to learn EPA's view of that and how they would look to move forward. Uh, my understanding is that the existing permit would need to get modified. So that would be, uh, we'd be good to know how they view that and what they would see as the timing to do that. Would you be comfortable with that? I'm, I'm fine. What I want to do is get started on that. And if that's what will bring, um, uh, DP, if, if that makes it work, that's fine with me. I can always open my mouth in another meeting. M Mr. Chairman? Yes. The only thing I would say in, in gentle pushback is that the rigor or lack thereof during the operating of the plant is germane relative to the rigor or lack thereof of what happens during the decommissioning. And so I do think it's important for us to understand what did and didn't happen uh, since, uh, since 1996 that could and should have happened. Well, so I me, do think that should be part of the let conversation. Me, let me clarify, because I'm not sure, uh, you know, let me clarify that the, the draft 2016 permit already knew there was a deadline for operations to cease. So EPA knew that. So there's, there's two phases in the draft permit. One, you know, they were supposed to issue it in October, so it was going to cover from October to June. And then there was, there was a secondary permit from June into the future uh, through, through any discharge into, into Cape Cod Bay. So, you know, and that's what they're trying to refine. Well, and it was, a, it was a fair start. It's huge permit. There's a fact sheet that whole tech relies on, and it's that part of it that I feel that we need to get clarity on because Holtec, the company that wants to spend the 1.3 or 4 or $5 billion trust fund, is relying on something that's not final. And so we need to all understand what it is, when it's going to be final. They need to understand that. And if there are issues that EPA is hung up on, I'd like to know what those are because maybe it was my comment. Okay, one more comment, Paul. Yes, I, I just want to say um, in Dave's defense, and he certainly doesn't need any, the DEP does a wonderful job for Massachusetts, but I don't want a mischaracterization or a misunderstanding by this group, okay, as to the date like way back in 1996 and the DEP's role. In 1996, because of changes with the regulations of outflows once through, all the power plants in the Commonwealth had their NIFTES permits canceled. And then they were reviewed and revised to reflect these new regulations with the worst offenders first. And they take like a year and a half apiece to, to perform. So that's why Pilgrim, being one of the best, least offensive <laughs> to the environment, okay? And we've had this discussion before. That's why it was last. And that's why it still shows up as draft. Okay. And I think we should all understand David, that. did you have one comment? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I, I think these are important issues to talk about. And, and, and certainly, you know, hearing Pine talk eloquently about pipes in the ground and, and something that I assume that her group uh, and she has followed for a long time, you know, is, interests me. I, I'm just wary that, that we kind of get a little too far into the weeds with, with this sort of amendment, I think we, you know, we need to make sure that these are important issues that are addressed. And it, it strikes me that now that we have an interagency work group that's actively looking at the issues with the plant, that 
I guess I would prefer that we push the interagency work group, which has all of the, the power and the weight of the state, to, to actively address some of these issues rather than getting into having Holtec and, and EPA right now come in and talk about some of the stuff that's in the rest of this amendment. So I, I struggle with voting for it the way it is and would prefer that the panel just emphasize to DEP or to the state that this is an important issue that needs to be addressed immediately and have them come back and talk about how they're going to mitigate these issues at the next meeting. All right. Thank you, David. I'm going to move this along. The uh, I'm going to suggest that we consider something here. Uh, clearly, the, uh, the logic of Pine's argument and concerns warrants considered discussion going forward. It ties into what the next topic was, which is the working groups. I would like to suggest um, a different motion, and perhaps, Pine, after you hear it, you might withdraw yours, is that uh, the panel vote to invite uh, EPA and the uh, chair of the interagency work group to come to our next meeting so that we can hear from the interagency work group uh, exactly where they are on the process, and they can hear as well the panel's concerns, and then the panel can ask the EPA the process issues that David talked about, and that in the interim between now and the March meeting, uh, we reconvene whichever of the working groups to really flesh out the details, because it is more than one piece. So that would be my suggestion about how to proceed. Clearly, both entities would want to know pretty clearly what it is you want them to be prepared mm -hmm. to discuss. Yep. And in that light, uh, whatever instructions you would send them uh, on what you wanted them to be uh, prepared to discuss, um, I would suggest maybe as it's drafted by whomever, if you would coordinate that with David, David, and Pine to get the the message that you want to get, uh, because I think yeah. it sounds like everybody's really wants to do the same thing, but the, the details are, yep. you know, the devil's in the details. I agree. But if there's there's some clear guidance that you all are comfortable with to go to them, uh, then I think if they agree to come, uh, we could save a lot of time because they know exactly what we want them to discuss uh, when they're here. Yeah, I, I agree with that. and. I've been listening to the discussion, and I'm not sure exactly what we want them to talk about. So I, I would uh, uh, offer maybe that uh, the chair task, I think you're going to get to some work groups, mm -hmm. that maybe the chair task a work group to figure out or uh, sort of guide the larger panel on breaking this down into bite-sized pieces and have us come up with a productive way to get the right folks in here at the right time. I, I think that's the ideal thing. Um, I, I don't think we're asking a difficult uh, question. So the panel members here that are trying to do decision making and our due diligence, we don't understand the MPDES permit process, how the process is done. If the EPA is the owner of that process, I really don't care about what happened in 1996. I want to know what's going to happen going forward. So to have the EPA to come in and explain the process for us of this is where we currently are at, this is where we expect to be as we move through decommissioning, and this is how the process works, I think that's what would be useful to the panel. And that could help us in our decision making when we're reviewing those documents. You comfortable with that, Pine? Yes. Do you mind writing that up? Sure. Okay. Everybody comfortable with Jack writing that up, giving it to yes. me? That'll be the motion of what we'll ask. So the revised motion, you're going to withdraw yours, Pine? I'll withdraw mine and yield to a simplified EPA as drafted by the And I think District we can do Priest. that at our subcommittee on cleanup and then bring that back to the full panel if that's acceptable to you. But we want to, don't yeah. we want EPA to come in sooner, please? We're, the, we're in the second week of February. I don't know whether we could coordinate that quickly to bring them in on the next meeting, but... I could sure work on something this week and get it back to you, and you can yeah. 
quoted to show. We can do that. Well, as long as we've got a consensus that that will take a formal vote on that, we'd like to move ahead and invite them, hopefully, as you said in the original, hopefully for March, but as soon as possible thereafter. If that's a consensus, yeah. that's my motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thanks, Jack. You're welcome. Thank you. So, Jack, you're going to send it to Pine. I will. You two work it out. I, I would CC David on it as well. So, just to be clear, I'm going to. Just what you said. That would be the scope what of said. what we would like the that's, EPA to discuss right. in front of the yeah. panel. Okay. Which brings me to the next topic. Uh, and, David, did you want to be also CC'd on this? No, it's fine. Uh, the next topic is reactivating uh, the work groups, our own internal working groups, because we've. Um, we've been busy. <laughs> we've had a lot of stuff going on. Um, what is the panel's thoughts on getting the work groups reactivated? Uh, Go ahead, Pat. I feel like we need to. <laughs> uh, certainly this, the site restoration and cleanup <laughs> work group should be meeting okay. and, and discussing things like this. And um, I'm certainly willing to, and I would hope that the other members would be too. Um, Heather Leitner was part of that, um, so I, I don't know if, you know, how we would round out the work group, or if you want to, because we're in a new year, open up, you know, for I, I other think, people. I uh, think that's to always been. Yeah, if somebody else wants to join, will you take the initiative to get that started, and reach out to the? If former? I can talk to Dave and and Jack tonight. Where okay. we go to set up a meeting date. Any of the other work groups, because I want to get to uh, Joe Coughlin's been kind enough to put together a draft of the table of contents and how we might approach the new one, and I want to get to that and complete it within the next few minutes. Are there any other work groups that want to reconvene and stop meeting? Well, yes, Kevin. I, I, I would say the same with the finance and economic working group. All right, finance and economic. And the intention here is to try to get a meeting convened and held between now and our next meeting. Okay, Joseph? Regarding the uh, PSDAR work group, uh, if the interagency work group is going to be um, putting together uh, comments on the uh, PSDAR, whether it's the Entergy one or the Holtec one or both, um, then I don't see, in, on, on the one hand, I don't see the need for the RPSDAR to get back on if the interagency work group is going to uh, do it anyway. However, um, Becky had asked us in November hmm. for the panel's comments on the PSDAR, and we've never responded to it. So that's another issue, and the, and the question, I guess, is does the panel want to um, provide uh, any suggestions or comments to her, uh, or does the panel prefer to say, um, look, we defer to um, the interagency work group and the expertise of all the agencies who are on it um, to go ahead with uh, their review and whatever comments they're going to send forward, if any. Um, well, we know what the dates. Are. We know what the dates are, so we have to hit those dates for the comment. Right, the dates are coming upon us just Three and a half weeks. a couple of weeks. So I don't know if this time is all that time, depending upon where the uh, work group is uh, on their comments, I don't want to muddy their waters. Um, and I suspect that the, the expertise that exists uh, in the agencies is probably collectively a lot more than we have on the panel. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that we have provided um, comments on PSDA as in the past, um, <clears throat> but still, I don't want to screw up the process with just a couple of weeks left on the deadline of getting the, the comments in. And if the interagency work group would prefer, a, notwithstanding Becky's request back in November, uh, but that time's gone, um, if the work group would prefer to be able to just keep moving forward uh, and to send their comments in and then maybe copy us on them in the process. I'd defer to them and say, please do it, because we have so little time left. Any other members of PSDA? Yes. Oh, <coughs> Sean, I concur with uh, what Joe just described. I, I have a more general uh, question, being the newbie on the panel, and 
not being a formal part of the panel when the 2018 report was officially put together, but I was behind the scenes as a public um, member of the public. Wouldn't it make sense to take the 2018 report, obviously there are a number of recommendations on each of the different uh, working group topics there, and simply update what's there. Maybe there are things that were said that were not uh, germane anymore. Maybe it's more development on the subject matter since a year ago there, not to rewrite everything, but basically, uh, um, to update. I want to hear what Joe has to say in terms of his ideas that he's been working on uh, over the past yeah. month for I, what it could be, but I ju I'm just throwing yeah, out a general I, thought I think there. My thought on it, Rich, and I'm open to discussion, my thought is there's really two separate issues. One is this specific response is by the deadline uh, from either the panel or to the state to the PSDA as has submitted. And the other is our report. Now, the state certainly has our report. It's been discussed. They have the other recommendations as well. Um, but they've done an analysis from what I've been told of the PSDA as, and that's correct, right, David? They've gone through them. Uh, yes. Uh, both PSDAs have been gone through. Yeah. The whole tech PSDR got the bulk of the focus because it's a lot of the data that was yeah, used sure. for the intervention. So um, we've all gone through the energy PSDR, but the process of having final comments developed has not taken place. So I would say, in reference to your question, that um, you know Becky would still uh, appreciate receiving any comments from this panel on on the PSDR. Here's my suggestion then: for those comments to expedite this. Uh, route them to me individually, and I'll make sure that Becky gets them. And then the state can decide whether to incorporate them or not. And Mr. Chairman, you know, again, because we have two PSDARs, the, the comment period right now only applies to the Entergy PSDAR, no. correct? No. 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 There's two separate ones. That's well, that, I know there's that, two. That's that third line that was down in the schedule, right? That uh, even though, even though, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think what Bruce and Amy said is that even though they're not going to formally take up their PSDAR until which time is the actions taken on the license transfer, they still are opening it up to comment. So, okay. so comment, but it could be in this sort of purgatory right. for a while. Okay, that's helpful. Is that okay by everybody's wrote if you've got any that you want from previously created or not? Okay. So now uh, let's let's move on to Joe's uh, efforts. Uh, Joe, can you share with folks what you're thinking about or your suggestion? Uh, yes, <coughs> Chairman. Um, in looking at the Taylor contents of our first report last year, uh, we had certainly the longest part of the table of contents was the breakout of the work groups, the five work groups, um, and the um, uh, observations, recommendations, so forth and so on, the activities and all the breakouts we had in the table of contents. Um, my thinking was that since uh, the work groups have not been meeting and it's February uh, and we only have a, a couple of months left, we're sort of headed into the same direction we were last year, um, but uh, with one big change, um, I was thinking we started off with the same things, the introduction, uh, acknowledgments, all that um, administrative stuff. Then maybe put in uh, a section on priorities. We have the priorities from the town, the 15 that uh, Sean mentioned that we got in January. Um, now again, this is to, it's not necessarily to take a position on them. If we decided to put them in there, it would just be to show the readers, the three different groups that we send the report to, um, uh, what the town is thinking of. Uh, those 15 recommendations or, or priorities are very specific. Whether we agree with them uh, at all or with regard to their prioritization is a separate issue. Uh, it's just an informational piece that there are a list of priorities. Then the same thing would be, and this is sort of new, at least from my understanding, priorities from the Commonwealth standpoint. Um, I'm not aware, I know that David has mentioned a lot of things that the, the interagency work group has been working on, but I'm not aware of any list 
that the Commonwealth has come up with to say, look, these are our priorities. There's five of them. There's 10 of them. There's 15, whatever it is. Uh, <clears throat> and that would be a very clear indication uh, in the report of two sets of priorities. Many of them may overlap, perfectly fine. Um, but at least it would give the readers a very clear understanding of what does the Commonwealth want out of all of this uh, versus what does the town want uh, out of all of this. Uh, then, if there was an agreement to want to do something like that in the report, then we could say uh, two sections that would follow it would be, all right, the interagency work group. Um, again, this would be the end of this year, so May, uh, May or June. We could say, all right, well, what's the progress uh, of the Commonwealth uh, in regard to uh, its priorities that are listed in the previous section. All right. Same thing with regard to the host community. Um, they've already identified their 15 priorities. What's their progress uh, towards accomplishing uh, any or all of those priorities? Um, uh, I think it would be a very clear indication at the end of the year, and therefore for the report that, okay, here are the priorities from the two major entities. Here's the status of, of uh, uh, what they have accomplished against these priorities. Pretty good indication of what's gone on uh, all year long. Um, then we could have the uh, next section could be the endicap recommendations, if any. Um, and the reason I say if any is the report we issued uh, last summer uh, had the uh, four, I forgot, four or five, of the recommendations from the panel. Then it had all of the observations and recommendations from the work groups in the report, but they didn't rise to the level of the panel actually uh, saying these are panel recommendations. They're just, they came from the work groups. But the three entities that the um, report went to last year, the executive branch, the general court, and the legislature, uh, have never, at least to my knowledge, have never officially commented on that report uh, and the recommendations. Clearly, <laughs> the panel's recommendations have been adopted, but there's been no official discussion um, uh, from those entities on the report. As such, the way I look at it is, all of those panel recommendations uh, may still be valid. Even, I mean, uh, work group recommendations, the, dozen, 15, however many there were. Um, <clears throat> do we want to resurrect those since they're still on the table because they've never been commented on by anybody uh, and say some of them are still valid, all of them are still valid, uh, without necessarily having the uh, uh, work groups have to meet on them? Uh, why can't the panel just take last year's report and say, okay, for the next meeting or the April meeting or what have you, and let's just come back and say, okay, we've got all these recommendations from the work groups. Here's the ones we recommend be in this year's report. Joe, could I, um, for the sake of time, because I, I am concerned that some of the folks who drove quite a ways, I don't want you to run into any snow or rain or whatever. Um, would it be possible for you to write up for me what you just went through? a little expansion of the TOC gave me. I will distribute it to all of the members of the panel and then at the March meeting, we'll adopt exactly how we're gonna do okay. it. Sure. Is that, is that okay with everybody? Okay. Now with that, we um, our two new categories tonight, a new business and old business, and we're gonna wrap them up in seven minutes. So does anyone have any new business that we have not otherwise covered tonight? Yes, Pat. Uh, since you're in the process of revamping the agenda, I was wondering if we could put it on there, uh, since we have the inter interagency working group, and I think some of the panelists from here are serving on that working mm -hmm. group, if we could have like a five minute slot to get kind of a quick update on what's going on during that month, or, you know, um, rather than wait until yeah, they. The, the number three on this one, will appear on every every one of the agendas going forward. Um, I talked, for example, with the Secretary's Office today, 
and uh, they will be here to give us an update in March. Um, you could imagine that they were sort of tied up with getting the paperwork they needed to get done today, but they will be here in March. So that will be on all future agendas yeah. for the foreseeable future. Any other shares? Rich. Yeah. I like what Joe just described. I don't think anyone wants to rewrite the whole report from scratch after last year. So thank you, Joe, for taking the time to uh, elucidate things here. Under new business, um, I want to offer a consideration regarding Pilgrim site radiological exposure cleanup standard. And this uh, topic still seems to be a contentious regulatory political hot button that hasn't been totally resolved between all interested parties, at least publicly. So I, I have a prepared uh, statement uh, brief I would like to review, Sean, Please. for the benefit of the audience and the panel. The continuing debate between representatives of Energy and Holtec and DPH regarding the appropriate Pilgrim Site Radiological Exposure Cleanup Standard was illustrated graphically in the January uh, 2019 NDCAP meeting minutes. Um, Mr. Noyes from Entergy last month and Mr. Priest comments made. Entergy and Holtec based their individually submitted Pilgrim PSDAR decommissioning cost estimates and associated timelines for safe store and decon, respectively, using NRC's current 25 millirem per year cleanup standard, whereas the 10 millirem per year cleanup standard recommended earlier last year by DPH was likewise acknowledged in the NDCAP 2018 annual report. But all interested parties should certainly agree on NRC's historically mandated as low as reasonably achievable ALERA concept we talked about earlier today. When it comes to minimizing potential radiation exposure to workers and the general public during and following completion of site decommissioning. Since time is money, one thing I don't recall seeing specifically addressed by Holtec is the potential impact, if any, on its decommissioning cost estimate and associated eight year decon timeline if they were to need to comply with a 10 millirem per year site cleanup standard. Such information would also be useful for our interagency working group to know, especially if and when developing any, any MOUs on the subject matter. Of course, any legacy spills or buried waste contaminants, either radiological or non-radiological in nature, that may be uncovered via an, any antecedent Pilgrim site investigations and or during the actual decommissioning will be, need to be addressed case by case by the Pilgrim licensee. And uh, <coughs> that's my two cents. Thank you. Any other new business? Joseph, we got two minutes. Um, recently, I was reviewing what's in this. Some of you may have seen the um, emergency public information calendar that's sent out by MEMA um, to the residents within the 10 mile EPZ um, around uh, Plymouth. There's a statement in it um, that I thought was interesting but misleading. Persons living in the 10 mile EPZ may obtain potassium iodide free of charge from the local board of health or ask your local pharmacy. Implication is the local pharmacy is carrying it also and you can get it for nothing. I checked with many of the local pharmacies um, like CVS, um, Rite Aid, so forth and so on. None of them carry it. None of them are aware of that at all. Um, apparently the statement's been in there for years. Um, uh, there's a lot of good information in here. The towns, apparently, this is one brand that's carried, the town of Plymouth um, has it. I don't know if the surrounding communities that are within the 10 mile radius, um, their local boards of health are actually carrying themselves. I've talked to Jack a little bit about it. Um, Jack's office does have a plan in case they were needed, uh, in case there was an incident. The only reason I raise it is we got Three and a half months left of operation. If an incident occurred, Jack told me before the meeting started that the real end of the period where it might be needed, I guess, is August. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to bring it up simply that the statement here is very misleading in the calendar and checking with these pharmacies, they have no clue as to what this is about whatsoever. Thank you. Any uh, uh, comments on that or no? Okay. Hearing none, uh, any old business? Excellent. 
With that, we're going to open it up to uh, public questions and comments. Uh, we're going to allocate 20 minutes. The, uh, for those of you who may be new here, um, you haven't seen our approach before, but we have a different approach than most meetings. So by a show of hands, those who would like to ask a question or make a comment tonight, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. That makes it very easy. It's four minutes apiece. And uh, in honor of your good work, Jim, you get to go first. Mary can go first. I don't want to get in the middle of this thing again. <laughs> Just a couple of comments first. I assume, as it's been heard, you know that there were two requests to intervene that were filed today, one by the AGO and one by Pilgrim Watch. My wife will tell you more about what each of those is about. If either of those is granted, there then will be a hearing on the issue of whether the license transfer should go forward. Timing on that, as you said, Sean, nobody can tell you. I'd then like to turn, but go back now to the comments on the PSDARs. Federal Register says the comments on Holtex are due next Monday. If they are not in by Monday, week from Monday, it's actually it's March 4th. No, no, it's not. No. No, it's two different dates. It's two, there, there are different dates involved. The Holtec one is due on March 4th. If they are not submitted by then, you cannot have any expectation that the NRC will consider them. The NRC has some general rules, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Joe, for late filings, but the basic rules in plain English is you've got to show me why you couldn't possibly have done this earlier. You didn't have the information, et cetera. That's their basic standard for accepting something late. <coughs> so if the working group is going to make comments, it's going to have to get those in by next Monday. If any individuals here want to make comments, like Pines, there's nothing that says you can't individually submit those comments, but they have to be done by that date, even though the whole tech PSDAR may not be considered for an extended period of time. Energies is on a different schedule. That, as your slides show, is the 31st of March. 21st. 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 A little longer, but not much. <laughs> yeah. These are hard deadlines, and if people have thoughts, if they've read the PSDARs, if they have questions or comments on them, you have to get them in. There won't be any hearings on comments. The NRC will take them, they say they will consider them, but there isn't anything approaching a public hearing process on the comments on the PSDARs. The only hearing process is the one that closed today, which was to file and request to intervene in the license transfer. In terms of just one thing was mentioned, it was brought up several times, of various papers that were referenced one thing, I'm sure you've read it, Joe, that the Holtec PSDR reference is something that called an historical site analysis. It didn't say much about it, but it appears to be a document that has been prepared by Energy describing Energy's view of the condition of the site as of some period in time. If that is what it is, I'd like the panel to request that it be provided to it, and Joe, you may have no idea what this actually is. Frankly, you couldn't tell much from the whole tech PSDAR, but it could be helpful for the panel and frankly the public to understand what at least Energy's view is of the condition of the site as of some point in time, because that's about all the information that Holtec actually had to work on or worked on if you take their PSDAR, because everything else they talked about was site assessments that we will do some time in the future. You get 10 seconds. The only other thing I'd say is if we get into the report, I hear Plymouth's local concerns. Let's not forget their other local concerns also. Thank you. Would uh, anybody like to make a motion on the panel to formally request that historical view that, did you? Don't, is there a second to that motion? Is there a second? Second. 
Any discussion on the motion? Hearing no discussion, uh, move the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? It passes. Uh, I will I will send a note uh, to both Holtec and to um, uh, Entergy requesting that they provide the panel with um, more detail on what the historical view of the site which was used by Holtec and cited by Entergy is. Okay. Mary, you want to go? I would not ask for simply an overview. I'd ask for the papers that were provided to uh, Holtec, number one. Uh, today, both the Attorney General and Pilgrim Watch, as my husband suggested, um, filed motions to intervene and request for hearing on the license application. Uh, both were pretty much in sync actually. Uh, Pilgrim Watch filed two contentions uh, and they were pretty much echoed by the A Attorney General's office. One uh, contention was in simple terms a concern that there was not a sufficiency of funds to do the decommissioning. And this is very important uh, obviously because A, we don't want to be stuck in the Commonwealth uh, holding the bag and with a partially uh, decommissioned site. And the second is a fear that um, the funds allocated uh, would indicate uh, a quick but not a thorough job. If you look at the PSDAR and look at the license application, what you see is a number of assumptions. What you see also at the end of the cost estimates is a $3 million rainy day fund, which means if the assumptions such as the assumption that all the fuel will be gone by 2062 does not come to pass, uh, assumptions essentially that the old and rather incomplete, we believe, uh, si uh, documents, site assessments that they relied upon the GEIS that was done in 2002 or the SEIS that was done for license renewal that was done um, in 2007. If you're going to rely on those and not on what may be the case now or five years from now or 10 years from now or 15 years from now or looking what happened to Connecticut Yankee, looking what happened to Maine Yankee, looking what happened to Yankee Atomic, that there is problems, s issues to be cleaned up, $3 million, who's going to pay for it? I think we know who is going to pay for it. So therefore, the great concern in the contention, number one, and also for the AG, is show us some money. We need some more in the pot. We know you want about a third in profit out of the decommissioning trust fund, which is the only thing that's on the table, we know that you're getting an exemption to use for spent fuel management and clean up the, de the decommissioning trust fund. We know when the fuel is going to be on site, when you take over, every five years, you're going to sue DOE for those management costs of the spent fuel, you took it out of, quote, our money, the DTF, but you'll put it into your pocket. That's a hell of a profit. I'm, I'm not against companies making profit, but let's be real. The but second contention had, had to do with the concern of the fact that there is no indication of an environmental um, assessment any kind of NEPA review, anything like that in the beginning of the process. So therefore, your cost estimates are fantasy because you don't know what you have to do. And also, without an understanding of what's there, we have no assurance, nor do you, what in fact is going to be cleaned up. So both Pilgrim March and the AGO 
we're on the exact same page on those issues. Thank you. Very yep, <laughs> absolutely. We, circul we circulated <coughs> the Pilgrim Watch filing yeah. to everybody on the panel. I guarantee nobody's had time to read it yet. I also received late, just before coming over here, a copy of the AGOs, and if the panel would like it, we can circulate that to all of the members also. Thank you. Who's next? Please. John, I also have some information Copies. from the Federal Register after the oh, public good. gets to comment on the actual dates. Oh, good. Uh, first, I need to make clear that my comments on January 16th, Please uh, uh, David Noyes, yep. um, th those comments uh, and my comments tonight are made as a private citizen and not a representative of Entergy, uh, just for, the, for that clarification. Um, made as a Plymouth resident uh, interested in ensuring the decommissioning trust fund uh, is used to complete its mission. Um, and I r respectfully request that the panel reconsider um, its advocacy for the 10 millirem per year cleanup standard. Uh, that cleanup standard is less than half of the federally mandated 25 millirem per year criteria. Uh, panel members in support of the 10 millirem standard have referenced the merits of a Bear 7 report, which is the seventh in a series of reports produced by the National Academy of Sciences issued in 2006. Bear or B-E-I-R, is an acronym that stands for Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. The study projects inc incidences of cancer on exposure to relatively low levels of radiation. These projections are necessary because direct scientific evidence on instances of cancer based on relatively low exposures to radiation does not exist. The study utilizes a tool known as the linear no-threshold model. This model incorporates a hypothesis that the numbers of documented cancer cases caused by relatively high exposures to ionizing radiation may be used to project smaller numbers of cancer cases from exposure to relatively small doses of radiation on the order of those expected following the decommissioning activities at Pilgrim. Relatively small may sound like an inconsequential term when we're talking about ionizing radiation in cancer cases in humans, but as a perspective, the higher federal criteria of 25 millirem per year is only about 4% of the 620 millirem per year the average person receives from natural sources like radon and man-made sources like x-rays and medical treatments. I'm not a radiological scientist and have not read the entire 400-page Bear 7 report but fail to see basic common sense in the linear no threshold model. An analogy to this model would be that if dropping a 2,000 pound boulder on someone will cause death or serious injury a high percentage of the time, then sprinkling a handful of pebbles on a person each week will result in some higher risk of death or serious injury. The study fails to account for the resiliency of the human body to low levels of all types of things that are inherently hazardous in large doses. The concern for the accuracy of this study is not only one layman's observation, but the opinion of several respected scientific organizations. The Health Physics Society, the American Association of Physicists in Medicine, the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, and the French Academies of Science and Medicine all concluded that the risk es estimates in the Bear 7 report should not be used to estimate cancer risks from low doses of ionizing radiation. These concerns are outlined in a 2014 article published in the U.S. National Library of Medicine, National Institute of Health publication by Dr. Edward J. Calabrese, a professor of environmental health sciences at UMass Amherst and the author of more than 10 books and 750 papers of scholarly merit. Dave, I'm sorry to interrupt, you get 10 yes, seconds. Sir. Okay. Um, understanding that the finite funds of the decommissioning trust fund will be used to accomplish the decontamination, a lower standard means more trust fund dollars spent. These additional costs, if not technically supported, could unnecessarily challenge completion of the project. I encourage NDCAP and the MDPH to reconsider its position on the cleanup standard during the intervention 
and enlist Dr. Calabrese's expertise um, if necessary. Thank you. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Who's next? Please make sure to introduce yourself. Hi, John Gawley from Hingham. Um, I'm still stuck on this, but I'm not safe with these casts, what they're made out of. Um, I spoke at the last meeting. I asked what the casts are made out of, and um, according to Holtex, uh, no, yeah, NRC's comment, paper that they crack, the, the steel cracks exposed to salt water. And I want to know what kind of steel, what the grade of steel is that they're made of. Does anybody know what that is? Huh? No? I was curious what kind of grade steel it's made out of um, or what the O-rings are made out of when they seal them. Does anybody know what that is? There's no O-rings. There's, no, there's one in the picture, so. They're welded shut. Okay. So then I, I read, a, um, I did a lot of research online, and there's a, uh, from the Health and Safety Executive in England, England his research report, RR902, has extensive uh, information on how this steel corrodes and cracks in the presence of salt water and heat, and especially in wells. So, I mean, that's a real consideration for me as a citizen, that this stuff that they're putting it in, how long is it going to last, and what are they going to do if it cracks? And I want to ask the AG's office to investigate, are they going to have enough money in an emergency to take care of that cracking? You know? And just a personal comment, I think 300 feet from a road is close. And you're going to build a wall? I mean, somebody can shoot that, right? So those are my concerns. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. It was much. quick, huh? It was very good. Nervous up here. I don't know how you guys do public service. Can I just ask clarification yes. your words? Did you say the wells or the welds? Welds. In the area of the welds, it makes the steel more vulnerable to chloride stress cracking. Felt right. like Pine briefly we were in my cousin Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Just real quick, the interagency working group. I, I think that my assumption is, but probably not a good assumption, I, I think we should ask and request that they do include the efficacy of the storage containers uh, in the work that they're looking at. They, they have the capacity to do that, but you know, we've had, heard enough from the public that you know, I'm not an expert in that, but I, I could be concerned based on what I'm hearing. I'm certainly concerned because the warranty from the company is either 20 or 25 years, depending on who you believe. And it just seems to me that something that has thousands of years potentially of public safety uh, ramifications gets a warranty of 20 or 25 years, uh, that actually would concern me. So, uh, David, I don't know if that's on the list of things we're looking at, but it would certainly, from my perspective, be a good thing for us to look at. And I'll also send a formal note. Thank you. Can I just comment quick? I just yeah. sent that hard copy to the AG on Friday, so she has it. Uh, Excellent. Thank you. Um, Diane Turco with Cape Town Windows. Hi, thank you. Thank you for all your work. Um, regarding the warranty, I looked at the San Onofre website and the, the whole tech cast there have a 25 year warranty on the canister and they have 10 years for the below concrete structure, but it's void if the concrete fails after its 10 year warranty. So that's that. So, you know, I, I just want to ask everyone. Yeah. Okay, at, at San Onofre, with the Holtec casts there, they have a 25-year warranty on the canisters, 10 years below concrete structure, because they're buried in the ground. Yes, and void if the concrete fails after its 10-year warranty. So that's what they have out in California. So I would say it's real important to know what, what that is for here. Um, so I, I just want to re remind people, do you remember when Joy Russell from Holtec International was here, and we asked how many plants, nuclear plants, Holtec has decommissioned, and she said zero. You remember that? Okay. Well, talking about misleading, Joe, um, Michael Toomey, the Vice President of External Affairs at Entergy, was just quoted on NPR radio program on Pilgrim, and this is his quote. Holtec brings decades of experience managing spent nuclear fuel as well as decommissioning nuclear power plants. So they are much more prepared to do this work. They have the expertise we currently do not have. That is so misleading. And that's from the Vice President of Entergy. Just to remind you of who you're working with. Also, too, you know that 
recently, again, um, screws were put in backwards. The, the workers weren't able to follow the directions. The ma management didn't find it. So we're seeing ongoing mismanagement, not following procedures, degrading equipment, and problems that cause scrams, a clear sign of a poor safety culture. And we don't want that to extend to the decommissioning. So it's really important that all of this, as you are doing, is pay being paid attention to. Okay. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry. This is from the latest Nuclear Regulatory Commission inspection report from uh, February 13th, 2019. Oh, and so I meant to tell you too that there was a problem with the casks. Um, the, w and, and I will read quote: "The inspectors witnessed Entergy's independent spent fuel storage installation repair of a multi-purpose canister, stuck lift cleat stud." So there's problems there right, at, right in our own backyard. So we see what's happening in Vermont. We see what's happening in California. And we need to really be vigilant to not let those things happen here. Um, so I just want to, I was glad, um, David, that you mentioned that we, you know, securing the protection of the Commonwealth is a common goal. Mm -hmm. So um, we're looking at the dry cast storage. And John mentioned about, you know, the new pad is 300 feet from the road, from Rocky Hill Road. Um, like right now, at the spent fuel installation site. Could, could somebody like drive on the property, past the no trespassing signs where it warns of armed security, and eyeball those dry casks? Could that happen? You know, given that the site is 1,700 acres, I, I would imagine that people could violate uh, no trespassing signs and get a view of the cast, but that does not mean they get inside of the security owner controlled area. Okay, and is that security controlled area um, a chain link fence? It's multiple layers of fencing, uh, video equipment, and uh, additional measures but, that uh, protect the site. Could, well, how is it protected? Could somebody be there for like 30 minutes without any security coming out? Again, we have multiple layers of security. If you try to climb the fence into the security area, I would uh, imagine that you would be greeted by uh, either security officers or what they carry. Okay. Could you eyeball those dry casks? That, I mean, that's, I'm not asked, talking about climbing the fence. Can you see them? Ten more seconds. Okay. Could you, you can see, see them? them from a boat in Cape Cod Bay. So I'm not quite sure what you're leading up to, well, but uh, trust me, the security at the site is robust see. and protects not only the plant, but the fuel that's stored on it. Well, I'm just concerned because I have with reporters gone on the property and been there for 30 minutes without any any security coming out, and we can eyeball those dry casts. So they're pretty vulnerable. Thank you, Dan. Just to let you know. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any uh, new topics before I ask for a motion? Sean, to uh, I just want to mention yes. something. Uh, I want to, yeah. want to get back to something I said earlier this evening regarding <coughs> the um, Mr. Watson, his comments about uh, the timeline for reviewing the submitted uh, LSA PSDARs and uh, that uh, NRC approval could be conceivably delayed beyond a year depending on the type and degree of anticipated intervention. I think the basis and reasons for the AGO and Pilgrim Watch's interventions are solid. I agree with the concerns. I haven't read the interventions yet. Uh, I will get to them. When, but um, my experience from when Pilgrim relicensing was taking place uh, is that the ASLB, Atomic Safety Licensing Board, goes slower than a tortoise. And I'm not suggesting that they rush through this whole process for the sake of getting everything done so the sale could take place. But I wouldn't be surprised if uh, things could drag on for quite some time before NRC completes its review and approval. And as I said earlier, time is money. And I'll leave that to everybody's imagination on what that means. Did, uh, did I miss someone raising their hands? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Do you all got an extra minute? <laughs> Introduce yourself. And uh, my name is Meg Sheehan. I'm an environmental lawyer. I grew up a few miles away from Pilgrim, and I've been concerned again about it ever since they started driving the trucks past my house to build the thing. But here we are, whatever, 40-plus years later, and Pilgrim has been releasing lethal radionuclides into our soil, groundwater, and air every day that it has operated. I have had multiple friends and family members die, suffer from cancer directly related to the types of man-made radionuclides that Pilgrim releases. Boston University has documented increased cancer rates in Plymouth related to the types of radionuclides released by Pilgrim. 
I have, um, as a lawyer in my advocacy work around the pollution from Cape Cod, off Cape Cod Bay and the groundwater, probably reviewed more of Energy's self-monitoring reports than any regulator in the state. Um, in fact, at one point I went to EPA to look at monitoring reports submitted by Energy, and this was in connection with the famous expired NPDES Clean Water Act permit, and all of the discharge monitoring reports were still in sealed envelopes and have, had never been, decade, years of them, had never even been opened by EPA. So I can assure you that none of the regulators, whether it's DPH, DEP, or EPA, really have any idea what is in the soil and groundwater at the energy site. I've, the self-monitoring reports are a complete joke, I can tell you that. I would urge the Commission and everyone else associated with this to get to the bottom of this NPDES permit and the cleanup standards. Holta cannot operate this uh, decommissioning operation it without an NPDES permit from EPA. This permit has expired. The draft that Pine referred to that came out in 2016 after years of efforts of Senator Wolf and others wide range of environmental groups, and myself included, of trying to get our regulators to actually do their job and renew this permit have obviously fallen on deaf ears, so it's up to someone else to do this now, and we really need you to step up. And that draft permit covers decommissioning. So there are requirements in there for what can be discharged into Cape Cod Bay during this decommissioning effort. The tritium continues to leak. DPH has done a miserable job in documenting what is happening there. I can assure you of that. There have been spills and releases. And to assert that we should go with some lower millirem is really pretty outrageous when you think about what has gone on there for the last 40 plus years and how this community has suffered and how this site is is gone. I mean, many of us used to go swimming and go to the beach uh, right there in front of Pilgrim, and now it's off limits to the community and the world for however long it's going to take to, I mean, thousands of years that stuff remains toxic. So I really urge you to do your jobs as best you can and really appreciate the fact that we even have this panel and hold those regulators to feet to the fire and hold Holtec's feet to the fire too and don't, don't let them go ahead with this without an NPDES permit in place. Thank you. Thank you. Do we hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one yes, question. Yes, Jack, yes. Jack was going to oh. talk to us about the dates oh, okay. of the comment period. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So reopen the, uh, the Google here. While you're doing that, I'm confused because the license transfer has to happen for Holtec to, to do their PSDAR. Why is the comment period for that closed prior to the comment period for Entergy's PSDAR? Well, there was a shutdown, if I'm not mistaken. No, I, I get all that. Is there some way we can submit a, a, a request that the comment period be, ex extended. be extended past the possible <coughs> license transfer? So that, so that if the license is transferred, we then have a comment period on their PSDAR? This is, from a process standpoint, this is absurd. It's absolutely absurd. Um, they're, they're closing the comment period prior to whether they decide whether there's a license transfer. Right. That is crazy. Yeah. It is. So I, I would suggest that we actually request formally that, that the comment period for the Holtec PSDAR be extended to a certain time period past whether or not the license transfer is approved. That is completely reasonable. What about if the AG requires request of stay? Yeah, or, or we request, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to drag this out, no, no, but that no, is no, crazy. No, no, this, well, this is well worth it. So let me give you some reference. Yes. So the fe this is from the Federal Register of January 31st, 2019. Yeah. It's about the uh, ap the action is the application for direct and indirect transfers of a license opportunity to comment, request a hearing, and petition for leave to intervene. Comments must be filed by March 4th, 2019. A request for a hearing must be filed by February 20th, 2019. That's why the interventions were submitted uh, this week. Um, 
it gives the, uh, the address. Uh, so the contact information for the NRC. So if you wanted to request an extension of the comment period, that would be uh, John Lamb from the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. His telephone number is 301-415-3100. His email is john.lamb, L-A-M-B, at nrc.gov. So if you Google uh, Holtec PSDAR Pilgrim, it will take you to that uh, Federal Register um, site that's the easiest way to get there instead of that link to the chairman so yeah, I, I sure absolutely i'll do it right now and, and could david would you mind asking uh becky if she would be interested in doing the same thing requesting uh i, I agree with dan the logic of dan's mm -hmm. argument that uh, these dates are illogical uh what they're doing and if the if our chairman is going to uh request a change why shouldn't yeah. the i in our agency work group do the same thing or have them do it in lieu of us. I think we should both do it, to be honest with you. Um, I, uh, one piece of information yeah. is the document number that you need to refer to. It's 2019-00371. Uh, um, here's what I'd like to suggest, and if we, yeah, please, in a way of a motion, um, that uh, the panel directs the chair to write a letter to Mr. Lamb explaining our area of concerns and requesting a delay or an extension or a postponement of the March 4th deadline until a determination is made on the uh, license transfer application. Because it's... To clarify. It is clear when you read the license um, request for transfer that there's an appreciation that the PSDAR is an integral part of it, mm -hmm. okay? So that is why they want to put the two together, because in order for the NRC to look at and make a determination on the li license transfer, they also at the same time have to look at the PSDAR. That is why. And so go right ahead and ask for an extension. Good luck, unless you've broken your leg. Thank you, Mary. Uh, yeah, I, I just. Move a motion? It is a. No, before I say it, it's a different process. It absolutely is. The license transfer and a review and approval of the PSDAR are actually two different things. And I think we need two. They're we, not. They're not. They're submitted together, yeah. and they review the they review and make a judgment on the license transfer application. They uh, don't make a judgment on the PSDAR. They yeah, right. accept it. They review it. They can provide comments to it, but they don't say, "Yeah, this is approved." There's no for hearing. PSDAR. There's no hearing process on it. There's nothing. It's an acceptance it's an process. Acceptance, not an approval. So, Correct. Um, but the the logic of the timing is what it speaks to. Right. So what I'm going to do tomorrow, if you guys want me to do it, is I'll call John, and I'll explain to him what the concerns are of the panel, and I'll say, do you want me to put this in writing to you? And we'll take it from there, if that's the sense of the panel. Yeah. So somebody make it in the form of a motion so we're on. Is that I the motion? Do what you just said. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that's wonderful. Uh, is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you very much. And to all you members of the public, safe drive home. Thank you.